All right. Um, <clears throat> our next presentation is um, the, the birth of prescription digital therapeutics. And I will say that I've never heard this phrase before. So um, I'm looking forward to this. And I want to introduce uh, Katie Ka, who's the head of strategy and insights at InCrowd, and Alex Waldron, uh, the chief commercial officer. So please come on up, welcome, and our presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We are very excited to be here today to talk about prescription digital therapeutics with all of you. And while I'm sure that many of you have been looking forward to and are interested in hearing about InCrowd's latest use case, we actually believe that it would be even more interesting for you guys to spend the next 15 minutes to listen to Alex and have him tell us about what exactly are prescription digital therapeutics and the path they've taken to earn a seat at the table within the medical community. So thank you, Katie. I, I really can't say that I'm going to be more interesting than I think Katie would have told you. But uh, sort of to get things up and rolling, let's just do a quick thing. I think Lisa made a nice point this morning when she said that there are six billion uh, smartphones. Quick raising, I think this is the perfect audience to ask questions of, right? Quick raising of hands. Who in this room has a smartphone? Awesome. Not a surprise. Who in this room has a mobile health or wellness app on their phone? Okay. I wrote this down so I didn't mess up. Who in this room has an FDA outcomes-based app with labeling that actually shows efficacy for a product? <laughs> okay, you're lying because it would be my product. So um, let me just do this. Let me walk through the concept of prescription digital therapeutics. The fact that Greg said he didn't know what it was, uh, not a shocker. I've turned it off. It's not a very good thing when a digital therapeutics company's presentation is going. Can somebody make it come back on? OK. Well, so the way I will talk. So, Prescription digital therapeutics, um, just to, uh, from a chronology, um, until the 14th of September of this past year did not exist. On the 13th of September, we at Pair Therapeutics um, had gone through a two-year process with the FDA where we had gone back in 2015, a group of people, a group of five people in the company, in fact, at that time, had gone to the FDA and they had said to the FDA, we would like you to regulate our product to which the FDA responded, I'm sorry, no one's ever said that to us before. Why would you want us to regulate your product? And the answer that we gave them at that time is very much true today. Um, the number of health and wellness products that are out there by way of apps and the way consumers look at them um, is very confusing, right? Physicians don't know what to make of them. Patients don't know what to make of them. And payers don't know what to make of them. They didn't see them as legitimate products at the end of the day. These are products that there might have been efficacy data or data that was actually driven by one of the manufacturers of these apps in the market, but they weren't ones that had been vetted by way of the highest authority that's out there in terms of clinical data, and that's the FDA. So back in 2015, Paratherapeutics went to the FDA and they said, we'd like you to regulate this product because of the legitimacy and the fact that they think that, this, that there's real data there to be legitimized. And they said, great, and we will regulate you as a well, let's see, you're not a pill, you're not a biologic, you're a, a medical device. Well, we'll get back to that later on in terms of how we actually look at you. So, on the, so back in 2015, the, this two-year process where we went to the FDA with a de novo application happened. And then on the 14th of September, oh, thank you, Katie. On the 14th of September last year, at 9 o'clock in the morning, the FDA issued our clearance, which in the world of the medical device is the same thing as an approval. And at 9 o'clock in the morning, Scott Gottlieb's office sent us our uh, clearance letter. And at 9.34 in the morning, Scott Gottlieb's office issued a press release congratulating themselves for birthing this new category into the market. So we couldn't even possibly have rushed to get our product uh, press release out on the product at that time because we didn't know what classification we were even going to get. So prescription digital therapeutics effectively are what we're looking to be as the next new sector within the pharmaceutical um, world. It's really the convergence of healthcare and technology, so it truly is a glimpse into the future. And it's where we are able to take the technology and really take um, proven clinical outcomes-based data, digitize that, and then effectively run that through the FDA as you would with any pill or a biologic product. So it's a brand new standard that the FDA is setting up right now. In fact, 
On the 20, uh, in mid-October, the FDA actually announced a pre-certification program for these new, this new sector of prescription digital therapeutic products. Because the FDA understood fundamentally that these are different from pills, they're different from biologics, and they're also different from devices. And that's the sheer nature of these products and what they want them to be. So when we talk about the concept of big data and a lot of the, 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 the concepts that have been brought up this morning, this is exactly what this is. When your product is data and your data is product, it's very important that you have innovative ways to be able to do this and make sure that you have a product that is constantly evolving. And that's one of the fundamental differences when you take a look at these products. So a prescription digital therapeutic is the same as a pill in the eyes of the agency and in the eyes of payers is very, very similar to a pill or to a biologic, to a normal prescription product. They, are, they have uh, CGMP standards that are in place quality management systems that are in place, and they're based on randomized controlled trials. So from the perspective of the agency and the perspective of payers, this feels like a lot of what they've seen before, and they can equivocate the outcomes that they're seeing for these products with the other ways that they've put products with the agency at that time. In fact, you know, uh, the, uh, from a legitimization perspective, the, the, one of the, as we think about prescription digital therapeutics, as, as we at Pair do, um, there are a couple of key legitimizing moments for this brand new sector that we have to consider. One of which is, is it legitimate by way of the FDA approving this product? We've done that. Is it legitimate by way of payers, right? So this is the same, you're actually receiving a therapeutic outcome on the same device in which you play Angry Birds. And I was corrected and said that's way passe at this point. It's really now Candy Crush. But you're effectively receiving your therapeutic of efficacy through the same machine on which you take calls, you schedule your meetings, and you play games. But we've actually found a way to, make the, to take some proven clinical data, specifically behaviorally based data, and actually help to rewire the brain. And people have said, well, that's not possible. My phone can't rewire my brain. And I look at everyone and I say, are you telling me that your behavior has not changed because of your phone? As children, the concept of nature or nurture, how in fact we become wired as humans, right? Nature you're born with, nurture is how you actually are wired as a child. As adults, we all strive to master something, right? We do something 10,000 times. If you do something 10,000 times, you've mastered a skill. My wife said to me, yes, but that's muscle memory. And I said to her very politely, not a single brain cell in any of your muscles. What you've actually done is rewired your brain. We have found a way through our, through our platform, through our technology, to actually create new neuronal pathways, we believe, and we're gonna prove this through science, to actually take proven science, and in the case of our first product, which is Reset and Addiction, for those patients with addiction, we're taking cognitive behavioral therapy, we've digitized it, we've taken it through the agency, and it's been approved. And that's really the basis of what we've done right now by way of a prescription digital therapeutic. As we look towards the future, what we need to do is think about, especially from an insights perspective, so I will, I will try not to completely pander to my company, but sort of say, how does this change things effectively? The reason that the agency looked at this originally and said this is a device, and they knew that that was wrong, and they knew by way of the pre-certification program that this would have to be a new sector was by the very nature of the product itself. So if I take this product as a therapeutic product and I receive my therapy through it, it's fundamentally different from any pill or biologic product that's out there because the pill that you have or the biologic you have, once you've actually released that pill into the market, that's it. That pill doesn't do anything. Maybe you can get clever as a company and spend tons of money, reformulate that pill, put it into extended release. You can spend tons of money on that biologic, on that protein, and take it from a vial and put it into a syringe and put that syringe into a pre-filled syringe. But that's all that you can do. The very nature of these products, and the FDA recognized it at the time, is that they will evolve, right? So they will evolve from a firmware perspective, from a software perspective, but more specifically from a data perspective and hence goes into the insights perspective. If we think about digital therapeutic products, when you receive your, your therapy on your phone, it learns from you, you learn from it. It is consistent, which is why the FDA likes it. There is massive accessibility for patients on time demand therapy. In fact, it's the first time that any therapeutic product will longitudinally and in real time be able to treat patients and follow every single step that that patient has taken. The amount of data that comes out of this is just gonna be massive. From a big, big data perspective, this is gonna be huge. The challenge for those companies that are gonna make prescription digital therapeutics is how do we take these data 
and constantly iterate and evolve this product. Pills are pills, proteins are proteins. Our product is going to evolve based on the data that we actually get from patients that are out there, from physicians' interactions, because there's a dashboard component for physicians as well. How can we take that? And though I really dislike words like uh, personalized medicine, we have the true ability through the metadata that we're going to be collecting to constantly evolve our product, constantly evolve our platform, and produce better outcomes for patients on an individualized basis and across entire populations. So it makes a tremendous difference as we start to think about this going forward, and as we as a company begin to look at all the various disease states in which a behavior is a component. So if you think about the diseases and the way that you can apply this behaviorally based science that we have right now, the number of diseases that are out there that are either purely neurobehavioral in basis, right, so that's PTSD, OCD, I mean, very general anxiety, those are therapies where we have traditionally as pharmaceutical companies, I'm gonna put this away now, I'm gonna hit someone in the head in a moment. We as pharmaceutical companies have dealt with these behavioral disorders by, by drugging them by chemically modifying a behavioral disorder. What if you're actually able to produce therapeutic outcomes based on scientific data, take that data, run a, run a randomized controlled trial, take that to the agency, and not just adjust the chemical or biologic dysfunction that a patient has, but actually modify that behavior to create a digital therapeutic product. Very clearly from a neurobehavioral perspective, you can affect the diseases I just categorized. But if you think about other diseases and how behavior plays into it, the ability to actually affect patients more profoundly becomes much more critical as time goes on. So we believe that there is a place in everything from psychiatry to neurology, oncology, metabolic, GI, and I list those not just to have a litany of diseases out there, but there are behavioral components of all of these diseases that just are not chemically treated at this point. So from, a, from the foundational basis, prescription digital therapeutics are the ability to digitize proven processes of modifying behavior, run randomized, cl uh, randomized clinical trials, run those through the agency, and have these products approved with efficacy outcomes that are out there. So that is the, the sort of, and as we think about insights and what we need to do, the ability to be able to quickly go out and find out information, everything from a user experience, a term that I had to learn, which was the UX experience that patients or people are having with their phones out there, to how the improvement of efficacy can happen on a regular basis is something that we're going to have to do more often and not less often. We're going to have to iterate and evolve this product on a regular basis, and we're going to need to be able to do that very nimbly, very quickly, very cost efficiently, I say to InCrowd right now. But we need to be able to go very quickly into the market and test these concepts out to determine is this piece of metadata that we're seeing on efficacy or safety or engagement or in terms of overall health for these patients critical for us to then roll out to everyone and how does that sort of apply to the entire population that's out there right now. So I think in an attempt to be brief, that might have been my last slide. Does anybody have any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. I can hear you. Okay, yeah, I think that's good. I don't know. Yeah. Um, we're used to doing this chart to match the cancer and it's usually true as well. Um, it seems to be a relatively high performing uh, therapy to get the harm out of it. I'm glad we did it. Um, but given that you've experienced in many cases of accidents when folks um, have a clinical outcome, does that create a, a very different regulatory environment for doing research? Do you? The answer is it depends, and that's the reason that we're working so closely with the FDA right now. So the way that the FDA pre-certification program works in digital uh, medicine right now is that there were several hundred companies that actually applied to be part of the program. Nine were selected, and we were one of the nine companies, along with Apple, Fitbit, Samsung, J&J, &J, uh, Roche, uh, and a few other companies as well. And the FDA recognized that they needed to have a path where if you're going to modify the app, what is a modification that actually affects efficacy versus a modification that just might be a feature or might be a visual aspect of this? So I don't have a clean answer for you. I think it's one of those ones that you're going to know it when you see it, and we haven't actually gotten to that point right now. Good question. I think we have time for one more question. Against the wall over here. 
Here, let me bring you a mic. My name is Benita Patacharya. I work for West Pharmaceutical Services. And the question I have for you is it sounds like much of what you can do through this particular medium is digitized cognitive behavior therapy. I'm curious, how does your app outcome when you do it head to head with a cognitive behavior therapy regimen? How does that compare from an outcomes perspective for any given uh, disease state? So, well, the, great question. So the first product, and by the way, it's not just cognitive behavioral therapy. It's any sort, no, no, but it's an important point, right? So not only is CBT a therapy that's out there, but also is um, uh, deprivation therapy, desensitization therapy. So it's any way that you can modify behavior through a proven clinical or psychological um, behavior to get there. In answer to your question, the way we actually ran the study was we ran it um, uh, counseling, uh, counseling alone versus counseling with the addition of the app itself. And what we found, which was extremely interesting, people said, how did people like taking, um, using the app in lieu of taking, uh, seeing a counselor when it came to these situations? Patients loved it. The anonymization that it comes from a patient's perspective and the ability to do things in real time is massive. That access component when it comes to patients and their ability to do that, we found them to be more truthful and to provide better outcomes at the end of the day than they would from a, when talking to a counselor in the case of addiction which would not be a great surprise. But that's also going to be very true for a lot of neurobehavioral disorders as well. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh. OK, and it's now time for uh, our first break of the day. We have two tracks coming up after the break. Track one will be in this room. Track two will be uh, further down the hall. So 